In the classic movie, What Dreams May Come, after a tragic car accident, the character Chris, played by Robin Williams, finds himself in a heaven made up of the landscape paintings his artist wife Annie created. Although not in the afterlife, Selwa, a young woman visiting a friend's home, finds herself instantly transported from the living room to one of several landscape paintings displayed on the wall. This is what author Cynthia Sue Larson calls a reality shift, a phenomenon that can occur at any time when an object or even a person can appear or disappear from our environment. I recently spoke with Cynthia about Selwa's reality shift and about her book by the same name. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for not just for accepting this interview today, but for all the work that you've done and the diligence um, in, in your work into these areas that are, you know, I think becoming somewhat burgeoning now, but um, are still, you know, there's a lot of people that are looking for information. And I think you brought a lot to the table when it comes to that, understanding some of the things that we weren't taught in our high school science class, so to speak. So I thank you for, for your service and all that you've done. Um, I know you've been a proponent of, you know, what you describe as reality shifts. And you have a book by the same name right now yes. um, that talks about so many different aspects of reality shifts and how they've always been a very real part of everyday reality, whether we consciously recognize them uh, as such or not. But I, I really want to ask you right at the start, what got you started in looking deeper at these otherwise sort of anomalies of reality? Well, I, start, I had an experience, and I'm glad you asked it that way, because the, the most amazing thing started happening to me when I hit a certain age. I, was, um, I remember it clearly, because it was 1994, and I just had a series of epiphanies, spiritual breakthroughs, um, culminating in what I can best describe as a kundalini awakening. And I, I know that sounds like such a technical term, but to me, it just felt like my mind was being blown open, wide open, I was um, unable to escape the spiritual awakening that was occurring to me. <clears throat> and the, the best way to describe it is just I felt um, like my um, whole sense of who I was was not at all true. Like I, um, like there's so much more to my consciousness, my mind, than I'd ever realized. And I'd had a sense of that. I, I'd been what you might call a very um, deep, um, thoughtful um, sort of spiritual child all my life, but, mm -hmm. but when I hit the age of, um, what was that, 32 years old, there was just this huge breakthrough. And I, I need to mention that because I believe that was the kickoff point for everything that occurred afterward, where I started paying much closer attention to things that had been occurring. Like you say, um, these reality shifts, as I call it, where things appear, disappear, transform or transport, and changes in the way we experience time. That has always been happening not just in my life, but in pretty much everyone's life, everyone I talk to. You know, people lose socks in the dryer, and or they might put something down, like their keys or wallet or coat, and then they come back, and it's not where they think they put it. People notice synchronicities. They notice um, spontaneous remissions of disease. They notice coincidences. Um, but in, I need, I need to just frame all of this uh, with that amazing experience that occurred to me where I really had a spiritual awakening. That's another way to put it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the real kickoff point because right after that happened, I could no longer ignore the fact that um, that these reality shifts are happening, and they're some of them are on a huge scale, and it's happening right in front of people's noses. You know, things are literally appearing. Some of them on a grand scale, um, such as a sundial sculpture down at the Berkeley Marina near where I live, that mm -hmm. just suddenly one day um, appeared in front of me and my friends. It looked like it had always been there. It looked old. I, I, there's a photo of it in my book, Reality Ship, <clears throat> and it's a very large concrete sculpture. It's, it's about 20 feet tall, and it's rather huge, and it, in fact, blocks the view of another sculpture that my friends and I had always looked at after we had brunch at the Berkeley Marina. So the fact that something had suddenly appeared, and, and it did so, Mm -hmm. looking like it had always been there for decades with a little plaque that indicated it was a gift from a sister city in Japan in some date in the 1970s, supposedly. But this thing, mm -hmm. now, boing, it's here, and it's in the 1990s, and, like, how on earth did something so old suddenly appear here? Mm -hmm. And I had just been talking to my friends about reality shifts when that occurred. So 
I'm talking about big things like um, that's like a big doors thing. and buildings and just entire changes in a restaurant's decor. Um, you know, things, people, animals being alive again that have been reported dead. Uh, this is the nature of the scale of reality shifts that we can experience. So it's not just little fox in the dryer, sure. and so forth. That's kind of the tip of the iceberg. Right. Well, I mean, you, when you speak of the, the statue appearing where it had not previously been, that definitely is a big thing. My question, Cynthia, is you experienced this with somebody that you were with, did you both agree that it, it, it just wasn't there before? And furthermore, did other people, to your knowledge, experience a similar thing? Or do you think that you and your friend perhaps were um, in the midst of an altered state in some way? That's a, That's very... a great question. Um, and I love the way you word it. Uh, actually, they did notice it at the same time. And I have had reality shift experiences where I'm the only experiencer. I'll just tell you right now, that's not as much fun. Um, because yeah. there's a tendency to wonder, like, um, is something wrong with me? I mean, I mean, am I misunderstanding something? Is my mind a little bit off? Maybe I'm coming down with a fever, that sort of thing. In the case of the sundial, I was with two friends that I'd known from the corporate world that I'd worked with um, at, you know, a Fortune 500 company for a number of years. Um, one of them is a uh, very, very high level, a direct report to... You know, to, oh, I don't want to name names and everything, but these are not um, fly-by-night um, drug-type people. No, uh, these were two of my um, top friends from the corporate world who are two of the most intelligent, um, rational, analytical thinkers that I know. And so when they also noticed, and none of us, we, don't, we hadn't drunk any alcohol, we weren't doing drugs, uh, when we noticed that there's a sundial sculpture there, and this was not a foggy experience, it wasn't like seeing things through a veil or seeing a ghost or something. This was absolutely seeing something physically real that we could touch and sit on, walk on, stand on, walk around. A huge, um, massive sculpture made of concrete. That is fascinating. Yeah, well, we're going to get into that a little bit more because I think there's so many theories worth looking into as to the the nature of reality is, 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 I think, what we're talking about, and furthermore, the plasticity of reality. So I, I want to kind of move us in that direction. But segueing into, as, as you know, we're, we're going to be talking about a story that I featured uh, not so long ago uh, about a young woman named Selwa who believes that she literally had a reality shift, but it's a little bit different in that <clears throat> her reality shifting was not necessarily an object within her um, space, but rather herself. And so, uh, but I think it's all going to somehow nicely weave itself together in terms of us really taking a a deep look into the nature of reality. And so um, her unique encounter, again, as I said, she had shifted realities rather than an object in her, in her, uh, uh, her space. How would this experience, Selwa's experience, which I understand that you have read, how would that coincide with how you describe reality shifts? Okay, well, in Selwa's case, she was actually <clears throat> looking at pictures in a gallery um, um, in a friend's home, and she would find herself, I'm just quickly summarizing, mm-hmm. that she would suddenly find herself in the picture, pretty much. That If she's looking at, um, for example, a dock near the water, she would feel that her legs were in the water, that she was no longer in the in the home of her uh, host or hostess, but she was instead in this entirely different scene. So that is um, that's an amazing situation where a person feels um, that they're literally transported into what I would call an imaginal realm. Now, when I use the word imaginal, I need to explain. I'm using it from the sort of the physics standpoint. Mm-hmm. That's right. Sort of physics um, and mathematics, imaginary numbers. These, these are not really imaginary. They are totally real, and in the world of um, in the world of reality shifts and uh, what you might call quantum jumping, where you can go from one reality to another, mm-hmm. the world of shamanism and so forth, this imaginal realm is the primary reality. So this is the place where it all happens. This is the place of setting intentions. Uh, this is the place of dreams becoming real. Dreams are real. This is the place where you can actually see something in the future and um, recognize later that you've, you're having deja vu, that everything you dreamt or daydreamed is now actually coming true, and you wonder, how is that possible? How could I have known this? How could I have been 
in this exact experience before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's our human um, tendency to believe that all we know is a very linear experience of time, uh, that things unfold in a certain direction always. And we, we, we tend to forget that we're able to access uh, all space-time when we get to a certain level of consciousness. So getting back to Sala's story, what I believe happened is that she accessed a level of consciousness where she was able to completely switch gears and take herself into this dream, daydream, imaginal reality. But once again, I want to emphasize that is the real reality. That's where everything is most fundamentally true and real. Um, what we see in the so-called physical world where things, that, as I've just been describing to you, they can appear, disappear, transform, and transport. Very physical, real things. Mm-hmm. We can instantaneously see wounds healed, like I talk about in reality shifts. And so what the, the uh, mechanism behind this, when people say, how can this stuff happen? It all happens in an experience like what Sala had, where the experiencer, um, usually someone who has uh, a great deal of control over accessing these different portals of, or um, parallel worlds of existence, can do so. And so this was not an ordinary home that Saul was visiting. So right. I, I want to let your viewers know or listeners know that actually um, you, you don't normally just look at a picture and can jump right into it. That's either an extraordinary person, which I believe Saul to be, and or also an extraordinary um, situation, an extraordinary home, which I also believe is the case here. Right. I think what, what's happening is you have a very a gifted young woman, Selwa, and a very um, energized and not necessarily fully grounded in the normal way um, of viewing place with the pictures. Mm-hmm. Certainly, as, as I was speaking to her, I, I could tell that she seemed to be very, or I should say, seems to be very susceptible to certain environments. You're right, I, and I do happen to know this individual. She is very gifted and um, very much um, inquisitive about these sorts of things. So I know that she's always had a propensity for wanting to have certain experiences like this. I don't know if it happened that at that age. She was maybe 15 or 16, I believe, when she had this experience. Um, but And she also did acknowledge, and I believe it's stated in the story, in this particular account, that the individual whose house uh, she was visiting uh, had and ha- is an energy practitioner. So clearly there were a lot of sort of, um, I don't think, accidental um, configurations of things in that home and those of us that work in this field understand that energy uh, can be uh, architected if you will to um, to give certain results or certain um, features if you will uh, right. to flow in certain ways and I, right. I definitely think that there may have been a certain flow in that home um, because it seemed like the individual the host of the home understood what Selwa was experiencing, although I don't know that they ever had a conversation fully about the experience. She didn't seem surprised, let's just say, at the uh, sensitivity that Selwa had to these images. So I um, I found that interesting, and I, I don't think that that's an accident. But, you know, I want to ask a question, Cynthia. When you, you know, when you think about individuals somehow you talk of quantum jumping and and many of us are familiar with that that phenomenon although i think science is still trying to unravel how that actually happens but the ability to transport oneself from point a to point b has also been described in a phenomenon we call teleportation um and the difference here it seems is that as as we understand classically uh the phenomenon of teleportation to be is literally the physical body uh moving from point A to point B. In other words, if I'm teleported to another state and I start here in Massachusetts, I'm no longer, physically no longer in Massachusetts. Um, The difference here is that, at least the way Selwa tells the story, I don't think that she was physically missing at the time that she felt her sense or herself to be in these pictures. However, there's some curious correlations that I find between the two. What are your thoughts on that, between teleportation and what we call loosely here a reality shift? Yeah, well, you're in the realm, with Sala's experience, we're getting into the realm of shamanic journeying. And so the shamanic journey is something that's been known about for thousands of years. And it begins um, with a very special individual like Sala in a special situation, usually um, 
some induced trance situation would be required, such as drumming, chanting, and so forth. But obviously, Sawa is such an adept that just being in the presence of certain energies and in this place where obviously shamanic journeying frequently occurred, she instantly was transported. And so, to me, a quantum jump often begins in much the same way. So someone who um, intends, for example, to teleport, uh, most of us don't have the skill set right now to, to consciously decide, okay, I'm going to go to this other universe and I'm just going to you know, jump there right now. Um, however, it, we may think we can't do that, but actually it, we are doing that all the time. Mm-hmm. So, so when I talk about reality shifting, I, I want to include everybody. This is not something that's just for adepts or just for gifted people, but um, all of us, all humans on this planet right now, whether we're awake to the possibility or kind of a little bit in a bit of a trance, like Gurdjieff said, that we're all a little bit hypnotized and um, basically sleepwalking, and that's okay, it's okay, because a lot of us do that until we wake up. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But I believe anyone listening to your show, Alexis, is already aware that that consciousness and our minds are much more than we think they are. And so for those of us who are aware of that, it's a lot easier to recognize that um, we can do some of the things that are quite typical on the quantum scale, which includes things like quantum teleportation, and also, um, you know, there, there are, uh, quantum entanglement is another thing that's very commonly observed on the quantum scale. Uh, so these kinds of quantum behaviors that occur at the very small levels of, the very tiniest levels of matter that we're even able to identify, right where matter blurs the line and starts going into energy waves. So everything um, actually is capable of, quant- of teleporting. Mm-hmm. And everything is entangled. I love tracking the science of this, and just recently there have been scientific reports that something as large as small diamonds have become entangled in the laboratory several meters apart. What this means is that macro-scale objects, large objects like diamonds, something you can physically hold in your hand, um, is responding instantaneously with another entangled diamond meters away from it. This is a huge breakthrough. Wow. So, so scientifically, they're showing now, that, you know, the science is starting to catch up with the shamanic awareness, this old, very ancient indigenous wisdom right. that tells us that we are all connected, that we can do things like teleport, that we can have instantaneous knowledge of things, and that we can move between these parallel worlds of reality. That's I know we're covering a whole bunch of different topics here. And yet they're all related. No, I think they that's... They're all related, yes. They're all related, and, and our, you're right. We have a very, um, I would call, uh, alternatively sophisticated audience. <laughs> I coined the term uh, alternative because that's... What, although I don't think this is alternative information at all, I think it's fast becoming the mainstream. Um, but I do, I do say that our, our readers and, and listeners to my new podcast... Are, um, are, are pretty intelligent when it comes to these things, and I think that they're getting the common thread that, uh, that we are weaving right now, so uh, very related. And a perfect segue, as a matter of fact, because my next question has to do with the holographic model of reality, which I know that you make mention of in your book. Um, I am a big fan of uh, the late Michael Talbot's work, uh, incredible work with the holographic universe, in which he, as well as you in your book, Reality Shifts, mentioned Carl Prebrim. Uh, the the neuroscientist who I believe is still with us, I I believe he's still alive, at Stanford, um, and his work uh, where he uh, makes the assessment that our brains really create sort of mathematical computations, um, and and that's largely responsible for the reality that we experience, whether uh, it be a sliver of reality or perhaps a, a slightly larger, that indeed you know, the, the, the scope of reality is so broad, and yet because of these computations, our brain sort of maps a very little pieces of it. Um, and I hope I'm right in, in my explaining that, because I know you touch upon that in your book. But yeah. I guess my question, Cynthia, is when reality shifts occur, and we, we experience them consciously, might there be a temporary ceasing or cessation of the typical computations that are taking place in the brain? In other words, what's happening to the construct when reality shifts occur? Love that question. Okay, well, I guess I want to back up a little bit. You mentioned the holographic theory of, um, basically that's one of the many possible explanations for how to describe 
the so-called quantum weirdness. And I noticed you like Richard Feynman because I've seen you yes. quote him as a philosopher <laughs> on your website. That's I right. Love Richard Feynman, great physicist. So, yeah, it's really true. Uh, Einstein and Feynman both pointed out that there's something really strange about quantum behavior mm -hmm. because it doesn't act at all the way, you know, these little things. I'm getting back to the very small again. But that's such a big clue for us that when we see that there's a part of reality that operates very differently than what we think. In other words, we are defining reality based on what we think it to be. It's a very small, narrow view. Just as our view of the color bandwidth is just red to violet, because that's mm -hmm. all that our eyes can actually see. That's right. Um, our devices and mechanical indices show us, okay, there's infrared, there's ultraviolet. It's a bigger world than we can actually experience with our senses. We need to keep that in mind when we look at the quantum. And so the holographic model you're mentioning is just one of several that are that are all really top-notch um, theories for what's going on. The many worlds theory is another one that was presented by physicist Hugh Everett III. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was referring to it briefly a little bit ago. And so when you look at the fact that a quantum particle doesn't just have to take one path at a time, it can take all of them simultaneously, that's... Um, Mm -hmm. That gives you the sense, um, like, how do you describe that? How do you explain what's going on? One way to explain it is it's a hologram. This universe is like a hologram. So you could break it into a million pieces, and any one small sliver has the whole thing in its entirety. And that's the concept of, that, that's one of the attributes of a hologram. I think that's that's well, a wonderful thing. I know William Blake, one of my favorite quotes, and I'm going to probably hatchet it because it's, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, the universe is literally within a grain of sand. Um, yeah. within a grain of sand, and I think that's somewhat implicit or indicative of the holographic model. But I agree, I think that reality <clears throat> is so plastic indeed that maybe the holographic model is just one way of uh, distilling the vastness of reality. And you're right, the many worlds theory, which is becoming more of a popular discussion uh, within quantum science, is... I don't think uh, I quite answered your question, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I absolutely, I, I do. I, I think, um, again, all of this is related. But, but again, I, I, guess, I guess my original question was, <clears throat> when we're experiencing, if I could say, a classic reality shift, for instance, I have a glass in front of me of water and, you know, on this table, and, you know, for some reason I look away and come back and that glass is gone. That's a pretty blatant one, but something like that. What is possibly going on in the brain? Could it be that those computations that Prebrim is talking about, the, the mathematical constructs that typically shape reality for us, is blinking out of existence or ceasing to right. allow us to see a bigger picture of that reality, i.e. the... Your question, you're getting into the perception side of it rather than like the reality aspect. Is that it? Or... If you want to know. Or is it the same thing? <laughs> well, there can be a difference, because what we okay. believe is just one part of the puzzle, like talking about the that bandwidth of uh, colors, for example. We can perceive red through violet, but we know that the world contains many more frequencies than we're able to actually see with the naked eye. You mm -hmm. know, we need a camera to see infrared or, or ultraviolet. We need some kind of mechanical assistance to, to detect those things. Um, so I think the perception aspect of it is one part of it, and then the reality is another. Uh, this whole business of reality shifting definitely beggars the question of what is reality. Right. And that's, I think that gets to the core and the heart of this whole thing. Because when, and then the original question I heard, I think you were asking, is what kind of mindset is required in order to witness or to experience a reality shift? In some way, yes. I, I think yeah. that really that is what I'm, what I'm asking. And yet, right. well, yeah. <laughs> So it, yeah. when you say that, like dictionaries often say reality is just the way things appear to be rather than what you might wish them to be. You know, that most of us are aware of that from childhood. And then real would be something that's in the physical world, not imaginary, dreamlike or theoretical. So we want to, you know, when we think about reality, we're thinking you can touch it, you can bang on it, you can pick it up, you can shake it, you can hold it, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You can use your senses on it, in other words. So reality shifts when something that we know is physically totally solid and real, and then it does something extraordinary, like this sundial sculpture appears out of nowhere, or like someone's um, sock you put in the dryer and it doesn't come out, only one sock comes out, and there's no way the other one could have gotten lost. But later it shows up in a very strange place. Mm -hmm. you know, that is 
and it catches our attention if we allow ourselves to be aware of these things. And to me, reality shifts are inviting us to be aware of them. So the, the way I'd love to answer your question is to take it um, to the level of what consciousness state is required. And to do that, I want to describe an example. Mm -hmm. well, we're all familiar with driving cars. Um, and if you're familiar with a stick shift, then you know that when you shift gears from first to second, um, and you need to take a moment to take your foot off of the gas pedal, put it onto the clutch, and what's happening is you're pushing the clutch pedal so you can disengage the gears and move from first gear to second gear. Very interesting. And then you put your, as soon as you've successfully moved the stick shift from first to second, then you put your foot back on the gas pedal. That is a beautiful analogy for how to shift between realities, how to move, how to quantum jump from one reality to another. How do you do that? And I would liken that clutch pedal to meditation and achieving a oneness state of mind, mm -hmm. um, the state that shamans are so adept in achieving rather quickly. And so what, the way we do that is we, and this brings back that story, to, you know, what was Sawa doing? How could she do that? Sawa, when I said she was naturally adept, I meant she can get to that oneness state of mind really quickly as a teenager, mm -hmm. and just be there. That's a skill and it's a talent and something that she possessed at the time. It can be developed, so regardless how poorly a person might feel they can do this, they can get better. Sure. And, yeah, through meditation, through prayer. Right. You know, and and that's, the, that's the clutch pedal. And you need to go there in order to switch between realities. Right. You have to disengage from the reality you're in. Mm -hmm. You have to let go. Solo is really good at that. Um, and then you're in, the, you're in that sort of state in between when you've got the clutch pedal. Then whoever's operating the um, gear shift, and Solo is using her eyes and looking at the pictures and feeling the energy of the house, uh, then that's re-engaging into this new reality. So you would... The gas pedal is just sort of just asking herself to feel, like, what am I feeling here? And right. she can feel the water, you know, licking her legs and splashing around and, and just be kicking her legs on that on that pier, in, you know, in the painting itself. But she doesn't feel that it's a painting. She's actually in there. Right. Well, there's no question. I, I love your analogy, Cynthia, of the, of the clutch and the shifting gears. I think that is a beautiful analogy. And it would seem to me that in her case, um, the shifting of gears was a very natural thing and a very spontaneous thing. Um, and I, I think that's a reality uh, for, for, for many people. They're, you know, it seems that some have more of a f natural ability to shift into these other realities, um, even, you know, uninitiated, um, where others may have a desire to, um, and, but have to learn. It, it's just not as natural, and it would seem to me that Solo, because she obviously didn't consciously invite this experience. She was quite taken aback, if you recall. She... She was really, she spent so much time really just trying to understand what was happening to her um, that she couldn't even recall all of the images. She just knew of the experience, but uh, the your analogy, I think, is so so appropriate. I, I want to ask you another question, and again, this, this we were getting really into it, sort of a, we could have gone into a deep sort of di digression on perception versus reality, and are they one and the same? I love it. This might fall into the perception category, but I wanted to sneak this in because I've always found this fascinating. Have you heard of a term or a, a phenomenon called, and I, I may not be pronouncing it right, pareidolia? Pareidolia, I, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is the uh, when people see images in things, in patterns, clouds, trees, fabric. <laughs> um, I happen to be one of those people, to be honest with you, it's, and it seems to have... Um, it, it seems to have happened a lot more in the last couple of years where I literally see images and everything uninitiated by me. It just happens. However, pareidolia is what I've, I've learned that it's been referred to, and I think it's, uh, it can be looked at as, uh, in some schools of thought, as a psychological, uh, um, not disorder, but an um, issue. Nonetheless, it seems to be very real for a lot of people. How would this correlate to reality or shift of perception or reality shifts, if at all? Well, to, uh, to me, that's a way of, um, well, I was talking about perception before, and 
the thing that's so cool about pareidolia is, it, to me, it's a little bit like synesthesia, which is different, of course, but um, pareidolia, you're witnessing um, a pattern in something that other people might not see a pattern at all. They might just think, like, you're looking at the moon, and the person with pareidolia would say, no, there's a man in the moon, I can see the face, or what have you. Right. And, um, and I do that, too. I love looking at patterns on the ceilings, with, you know, or the walls, seeing textures. Um, once again, jumping back to the concept of shamanism, what do, you know, what's the purpose of this in reality shifting? The purpose in reality shifting is, um, or the, the way that it's useful, is pareidolia allows um, the shaman to be able to use any kind of, um, any, anything at all that they're looking at, whether it's trees, wind, clouds, birds, animals, ants, anything, well, is talking to them. The universe is, is carrying on a conversation mm. with the shaman 24-7, mm-hmm. all the time. And I talk about this um, living with a feet in both worlds concept in my book, Reality Shifts, because it's, the thing about reality shift is you're living in a waking dream. You're awake, you're lucid, you're aware that this universe is talking with you. Yes. You ask a question... You don't have to ask it with words. You don't have to say it out loud. That's right. That universe, if you, the more clearly you concentrate on your question, the more instantly and clearly you're going to get answers back from the trees, the clouds, the ants, and so forth. And what the shaman could do that you're able to do, Alexis, is look at anything as a divination system. And when I say divination, I mean from that ancient sense of interpreting a meaning in something that anyone else would think, well, that's just a candle flickering. You're just gazing into a crystal ball. You're just looking at the migration pad- pattern of a flock of birds. But the shaman would see an answer in exactly what they want to know. And this was used by indigenous peoples for millennia. When Native American tribes would be crossing, um, you know, just f- to look for um, the bison or whatever that they're following, they would, the shaman would ask the question, which do, way do we go and when? Mm-hmm. And it was very typical and expected that when the shaman asked that question, uh, something bizarre might happen, like a fox might run into the encampment. Right. The fox would just, um, I, I, this is very unusual for a fox to jump into huh. a circle of tents where people are present. But this, because the shaman's asking the question, it's expected that nature will answer. And so something like that would happen and did happen. And then the fox would then proceed in a certain direction. Um, and that was the clear message to the shaman who would understand from pareidolia, from understanding all of these signs. It might not be a fox. It might be looking at the clouds sure. or anything. That's amazing. So wow. I. <laughs> that's amazing because, you know, the next question I wanted to ask, and I think you've answered it, is, is there, for those of us, whether shaman or layperson, that are seeing these images and otherwise mundane things, do these images have intelligence behind them? I've always wondered that, and I think you've, you've answered in the affirmative that indeed um, it's not necessarily the image itself having a unique intelligence, and yet it is intelligent by virtue of the fact that it is the universe's intelligence uh, communicating with you. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? That's exactly correct. I believe that the earth is alive and the universe is alive, and there's this amazing love and consciousness implicit and inherent in everything. And that's, um, that's the heart of the book, Reality Ship. I really get into a lot of that feeling state and that sense of um, living in this waking dream. But to me, it's, it's all about <clears throat> the mundane things that you need for survival. It seems like we're often in this habitual state where we just wake up, we take a shower, you know, we have breakfast, have our cup of coffee. And, and yet, if you allow yourself to recognize that you are much more than just your body, <clears throat> and um, that, that it's much more than just your mind, that there's something which you might call spirit, that there's something that's bigger than all that. There's a sense of you that's far beyond any limitation. That's right. And it, it kind of blows our ego sense of identity. And I know you wrote that great blog about um, RIP to the ego. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I love that. <laughs> Well, I certainly, I certainly think that we're at a time where many of us are realizing that in order, I, mean, I think we're all sort of looking for this evolution and some sort of um, catalyst or impetus for that evolution. But uh, in reality, I think, you know, in order to, to do that, we're going to have to step down what, what has been so overdeveloped, which we call the ego. So, yeah, that was kind of my stab at <laughs> bringing that out as a point. Um, 
So thank you for that. Yeah. Another question, getting back to Selva's story, and these are all kind of segueing nicely because we're now talking about images and perhaps uh, intelligence and energy, energy and information. We know uh, that energy is information. Um, symbols. Uh, Selwa not only experienced sort of transporting herself to the landscape paintings that she was seeing, but she also tells uh, in the same visit uh, of an account where she was looking at a picture that had symbols of some sort. Now she, she says that she can't recall what the symbols were, but they were certainly some sort of uh, ancient symbols that were represented in one of these images. And she says that every time she put her hand over this one image, even though she can't recall it visually, she would have, she would nearly pass out. Um, <laughs> I, I found that she was she was disoriented, and I, I found that to be very very curious. So again, we're we're talking about images being energy information, and perhaps being the impetus for shifting reality. What what are your thoughts on that? Well, that is interesting. I I haven't um, formally studied much of the nature of symbols as gateways to consciousness, but I know a lot of people that practice magic, both the black and the white kinds, um, <clears throat> definitely work a lot with symbology. And you mentioned Reiki, I think, in that article about Selma. And, of course, Reiki works with um, symbols. Those I'm familiar with have seen mm -hmm. Reiki symbols. Um, uh, so this, this is a whole frontier here. Um, what I would say about symbols <clears throat> and the way that they help people attain that, um, uh, well, with the, going back to the model of shifting gears and the clutch and, the, and the, um, you know, all of that business, What's happening with the symbols is that they easily um, allow a gateway for people to both go into that um, between gears place mm -hmm. much, and then it, they pre-select a direction that the, the experiencer would go um, frequently um, as guided by somebody else who's present. Um, it, it, I, I, for those listening, I would just like to put something out there and just say, okay, this is a a big, wonderful world of symbols and so forth, but, and I just mentioned Reiki, and I can heartily endorse that and suggest that people pursue that, but um, this whole business of symbols opens up what you might call like Pandora's box or a can of worms, um, because um, due to the, the nature of man's curiosity, you know, getting into this world of, well, if we can move to imaginal realms, let's see if we can direct it. My book, Reality Shifts, actually um, recommends against um, putting your ego in charge and steering everything. I, I think we tend to mess things up when we do that. I agree. So, um, I would recommend taking a very spiritual approach, as I do recommend in my book, Reality Shifts. But for the listeners, that would mean, you know, like anybody tuning in, they, they, I, I would recommend people, um, you know, find their own path of spirituality, something that if the world was full of it, they'd be happy to be in that world. I mean, truly, on every level of their being. And so that would that redirects in a direction of how good can it get, which is like heaven on earth, which is like um, it's like spirit, it's like light, it's like um, all the things you'd want to experience. Mm -hmm. Humans have a dark shadow side as well. Yes. So this whole business of symbols brings up all of that because it brings up intentionality and humans' desire to steer things, direct things. Ma whole practice of magic is. I think I know what I want, so I'm going to direct this kind of outcome that I think I desire. We have these problems with our technologies right now um, in humankind. We, we think we know what we're doing. We think our egos understand it all. Instead of putting spirit first, we put spirit, I don't even know where we put spirit. We think it's just um, assisting and running around like a robot or something. That's, That's right. the wrong way around. Right, right. We need to put spirit first. We need to put love first. I absolutely, I could not concur more. I think that's very well said. There's such a fine line. Uh, you're right, ego, ego, because it's been in the driver's seat, it has been the one, uh, to whatever extent magic is practiced, uh, the gear shifter, if you will, the clutch, I, I guess I should say. Um, so I think, uh, and this sort of goes back to, I think, a message that was given to Selwa by the host at some point is that energy must be used responsibly and that love should be the steering wheel, not anything other than that. So I think that's very well said. Um, well, as far as reality shifts are concerned, if, if people wanted to initiate, and maybe this is kind of, we'll kind of, 
put us back to what we were just talking about a moment ago. Um, uh, not wanting to manipulate reality necessarily, but to experience the magic, the, the light magic, if you will, the wonder of uh, reality shifting. Uh, are there some practices that, that people could do uh, consciously to try to have more of these type, sorts of experiences? Oh, yes, definitely. And that's, I, um, I think what I'd recommend is just get into that state of uh, reverence for daily life. And it's really mindfulness. And so the way to do that is um, something that's not so fun, perhaps, as just regular meditation and regular prayer, which I think a lot of people take to that, like brushing their teeth. You know, it's something you have to do so that when you go to see the dentist, you get a good uh, checkup, but not something that thrills people. But, but here's what's amazing about doing a regular practice of meditation mm -hmm. and prayer, is that it allows us to start seeing the ordinary as the extraordinary. Right. In other words, to feel like you're on a vacation when you're just in your own home, to feel like um, you're just living in this amazing, blessed, magical, miraculous reality. Um, it's a state that's kind of like if you read Rumi's poems and he, everything just seems like it's just like the world is full of love. Um, that's what it's like. It's just feeling that there's such um, a blessed joyfulness about being in this world, just like it is. Um, so that's that's the heart and the spirit of, of you know when I was writing reality shifts, what I was show, sharing with people, just lots and lots of stories, of course, and then a feeling of what it feels like when these things are happening. But I have meditations in the book that. And the reason for that is just to help people understand that this is where it all begins. It's the way that you are opening your mind and your heart, your energy centers, your awareness uh, to accessing um, the totality of reality. Because there's a lot going on that we tend to shut out. We right. shut out the miraculous. The reason most people don't notice these just far out kinds of reality shifts that I've been so blessed and fortunate to witness is that they're limiting their own um, uh, degree of being open-minded. When you're open-minded, you can see things literally manifest out of thin air. I would agree. I would agree with you. I, I've been blessed as well to ha have had parents that nurtured open-mindedness. And that can be a whole other discussion we can have offline, but I think it actually did give me um, a freedom, you know, uh, freedom of... of um, experience um, and cherishing mindfulness um, so yeah I agree so what you're saying is that just by simply uh, l noticing the wonder and the miracle of life in and of itself might actually be over time a trigger to start to see things that would be even more magical just by acknowledging yeah. that the everyday magic can can perhaps bring uh, even greater more, um, I don't know, specific reality shifts. Right. And when I say magic, I mean in the sense of the, the real magic. Absolutely. I, I think, <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you. Right. Not ego directed, but. Oh, yes. To me, that's a little magic with a small M. It's not the big thing. Right. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I guess just intuitively, I've always looked at magic as something being magical. When something is magical, when you see a rainbow, um, and how are those, that spectrum of color, how is that being constructed, and what in the environment is making something so beautiful? That, that's sort of how I've always looked at something that's magical versus practicing or forcing a magic. So yeah. I agree with you. I absolutely do. You know, again, I, I, my, uh, my readers and listeners know that I'm a huge fan of the holographic universe and Talbot's work, so I'm going to bring it up again, but I think in, in context with what we're talking about here. Um, he tells a story. I don't know if you've read the book, Cynthia. Um, I was, love that book, and it was the major influencing force as in the reality me. shift. As with, <laughs> yes, as <laughs> with of, me. Still, if it was a parent book, it would be the holographic universe. Absolutely, and I actually have that on my site for, for folks that want to check it out. I think it's really just a, a perennial classic and a it great is. reference book. But so then you're obviously familiar with a story that I think has been retold so many times because it's such a poignant example of the plasticity of reality. And this is the story of the hypnotist that Talbot, I guess, had been in the presence of who put a man into a hypnotic state and gave him a command that when he 
opened his eyes and came out of the state that he would no longer be able to see his daughter in the room. Um, and uh, upon command, that indeed happened to the surprise of everyone, including the, the, the father. But then furthermore, that hypnotist was able to take a pocket watch out of his pocket and put it behind because the daughter was there all along, but the man couldn't see her anywhere in the room. When he took the pocket watch, he put it behind the small of the little girl's back and asked the man if he could see what he was holding in his hand. He leaned forward as if looking through the small of the little girl's back and said, well, you're holding a pocket watch. And then he proceeded to read the inscription on the watch. This to me, I read this account and I've heard it retold dozens of times and it still obviously defies logic. Would this be, Cynthia, a, a reality shift? Or again, are we talking about a shift in perception? What's going on there? That's a great question. <clears throat> and I think once again, we're getting, when you mentioned the hypnotist, mm -hmm. so there you've got the access to that oneness consciousness. It's that, it's like the clutch pedal again. Like how do you get to that oneness state where you can choose between all realities? There it is. Hypnosis. And so, the hypnotic subject has entered a trance, and they are therefore able to enter the experience of a world in which there is no um, daughter sitting in that chair. And so, yeah, that's one way to describe it, so that he can see right through it. We're getting into the heart of all these um, questions about what's going on with the quantum level of reality, really. And so, when I said there are many theories, there's the holographic theory, there's the um, transactional interpretation, the Copenhagen interpretation, right. and, you know, and so forth. And then. <clears throat> the many worlds interpretation, which I love. And so what, uh, you can look at it from the many worlds interpretation and say, well, that hypnotized subject went to another world, uh, another universe, where that chair indeed was empty, just as he's imagining it. And he can get there because he's been, he's been inducted into a hypnotic trance. So easily he can see the watch with the transcription. And it, we're, we're basically asking, um, you know, how is it possible for us to experience this quantum weirdness, weirdness being how can he read something when it's physic something physically blocking, you know, his daughter is sitting in a chair. That's amazing. So it could be because it's a holographic universe, it could be because of the transactional interpretation, in other words, right. you can, there's information between the future and the past through this sort of a handshake through reality. Mm -hmm. So there are many, many different ways we can look at this. Um, right, right. And then, and then, of course, the many worlds, so... Yeah. It doesn't matter which theory, they could all be correct, too. I, I agree. It could have yeah. to be just one. Maybe they're all correct. I agree. And, you know, it's interesting as we, as we um, both of us, you, you being more adept on the scientific side, of course, than I, but I, having touched that on a cursory level in my, in my research, you know, it's so interesting how science is, has such a, um, a need to define. I think we all do at some level. Why is this so and how, uh, how does this happen, you know, from a linear based uh, uh, framework. But I don't know, I, agree. I think where you're going is, it, does it really matter what theory or what bucket we put it in, but rather what it really shows us is that reality is a very, very flexible landscape. And on some level, regardless of what we call it, the holographic model, the many worlds, Copenhagen theory, etc., it is a very malleable, movable, as are we, um, form of energy. So that in and of itself, I, you know, I, it's funny, in my years of, of research and just contemplation, I think I've always had a propensity toward these subjects, even as a child, um, it, it, I've never felt the need to commit myself to, it means this. Or it's got to be that. I think that there's just something about the mystery. And this, again, is where the quote of Feynman, my, probably one of my favorite quotes, it does no harm to the mystery to know a little bit about it. But indeed, there is a grand mystery. And, and let's not necessarily get so caught up in figuring out the why. Let's just be a part of what we are anyway. And I, oh, I, got I love a little... that. I, I, I so agree with you there. And this is where I feel such a kindred spirit in you. Because I think when we... Um, analyze things down and use that rational mind. And if you think of the, the idea of the bicameral mind with, with mm -hmm. the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere have very different functions. And so one side is very rational and analytical and the other is intuitive. We need both. Yes. And I think that mystery resides in the intuitive, that all-encompassing part of our mind that so easily can embrace the holistic qualities that might be present that we can't necessarily rationalize. Like what is love? It's the thing we're living for. But we can't weigh it, we can't measure it, we can't 
tell us anybody what color it is or what it looks like. Right. How do we know it's what we're living for? You know, that's kind of a, a strange thing. Yeah. If we're not living for love, then what are we living for? You're absolutely it's right. Not money or so yeah. forth. So, and yeah, I, totally. I think we all know that at a deep level will again a beautifully synch synchronistic segue once again. <laughs> I love the way these things happen. You know, you talk yeah. about that we need both, and I agree. I couldn't agree more that we do indeed. We need the ego for for goodness sakes. For whatever reason, it is there, and it and it can serve um, in its place. Of course. Um, uh, it can serve us uh, in, in certain ways as we live in this 3D reality. But, you know, everyone's talking, Cynthia, about the shift. The shift has almost become as big a term as, I don't know, I don't want to compare it to 9-11, but you say 9-1-1 and you know what that means. The shift, same thing. Uh, it's a big subject these days. And more specifically, the planetary shift that many believe uh, is somehow connected to the Mayan calendar's 2012 end date, and as well as other indigenous cultures that talked about these times. You talk about reality shifts in terms of, you know, individual or anecdotal or personal stories, um, and yet w there's a big shift going on. Uh, might we be witnessing one grand reality shift, and isn't there a connection um, with all of this? Could this be why so many are witnessing their own personal reality shifts? In other words, does the micro is the micro related to the macro? Are we seeing more reality shifts personally because we're actually going through a planetary shift? Yes, I believe that is true, and there's <clears throat> that tie in. And I don't know; it's, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. You know, is the individual influencing the mm -hmm. whole, or is the whole? You know, both are <laughs> happening definitely. Wow. Um, and I believe we're steering this spaceship Earth right now, but we, with our individual intentions and our individual ability to keep our, um, our, our minds open and our hearts open and to wake up. You know, I think that's what the big shift is all about, is waking up. And that ties in completely with what I talk about with reality shifting. It's the same thing, really, to be mindful, to be awake, to be in that lucid state of awareness. If you have a lucid dream then you know you're dreaming when you're dreaming. That's right. We need to do the same thing when we're awake. And that's what my book, Reality Shift, is all about. It's about, mm. and the concept of reality shifting is all about that. It's about being awake and recognizing that through our intention, through our imagination, um, we are literally creating what's going on in this world all the time. And the whole universe is talking with us. Mm -hmm. We're always in the, engaged in a dialogue. And I think a lot of people are accessing this... Um, what, what it, we used to be called a shamanic ability is now opening up to many, many people. And there's this global awakening that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Just um, huge. I wrote a chapter for the book 2012, um, Creating Your Own Shift, and it, it's a chapter on reality shifting. And it's really, it's about a vision that I once had that I was looking up, I was lying on the earth, looking at all these earths above me coming together as one. So... It's sort of like they were all coming together, all these many, 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 many worlds. Hmm. It's all coming into one. And that's such a strong image. Um, it's a lucid dreaming kind of an image that I've received. So what is really happening right now is that we are achieving a state of awareness that's um, unparalleled, I think, within human history. Mm -hmm. That We just haven't had an opportunity to have... Um, if you look at the scientific advances and the exponential growth of awareness and so forth, just the change that's going on and how interconnected everything is through the Internet, how our tools are kind of taking us to a level of awareness. Well, they're giving us gifts that enable us to use uh, these um, you know, universe-given, God-given um, abilities that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Do you believe that there is... <laughs> A specific demarcation is what I'd like to call it. I don't like to use the word end because I don't know that there is such a thing as end. I, I tend to think there things are cyclical, always have been. But, you know, with all of this talk about, let's not even say 2012, let's just call it the shift. I happen to believe that we've been in it for a while and will continue and remain in it for quite some time. But there are some that believe there to be a specific demarcation, an event or a series of events. Others... 
uh, think that it may be more of a subtle process. I know Dolores Cannon talks about in her Convoluted Universe series, at least in the last one, that it's that a new Earth is literally developing, but it's a very slow and gradual process. It won't be a big bang, so to speak. What are your thoughts on that, Cynthia? I'm, I'm with you on this one and Dolores Cannon, too. When, when you watch a solar eclipse, for example, and we've had some interesting... Uh, astronomical events lately, yes. you go out and you might notice, like, wow, it's starting, but it, it just takes hours for the darn thing to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people don't just stand and watch it for hours. They they go inside, get a cup of coffee, do something, you know, check the Internet, whatever, talk to people, go out and check the sky again. And that's pretty much what's going on with 2012. So you can say, um, some people say, oh, it happened already, or it's already happening. Yeah, that's true. And it's unfolding, and it's going to take a while. It's not going to be just one big flashbang moment, but it's it's unfolding the way all natural cycles do. So Very as you can see, a lunar or solar eclipse, where it just takes a long, long time. Sure. So, that is a great example. And, I mean, we just had the Venus transit about, what was that, a week or ten days ago. And, yeah. uh, unfortunately, we didn't have an opportunity where we were physically located to see it happen. But it, I was watching it through one of my little uh, iPad apps, Starwalk, I believe it was. Plug for Starwalk. It's a great app. But it took time for that. It, although it was a relatively short time, it, I think it was maybe a, a day or a day and a half. Yeah. Um, but it still was a process. It was not an acute event of it just appearing and it's done. Um, so I think that's that was beautifully said. That's very powerful. I think people, because unfortunately I think there is a fair amount of catastrophobia going on, um, you know, encouraged by various um, outlets, the media, uh, not the least of which is the media, but um, I do think we need to remind ourselves of that. It's really kind of a constant check-in, if you will, like you said, going back out and looking at the sky to see what's a little bit different this time. Well, we need to do the same thing with our surroundings. Um, right. What's a little bit different now? What's expanding? What's contracting? So, yeah. what, excellent. What do we want more of and what's happening? Right, right. What's a, if there were one thing, Cynthia, that you'd like the readers of your wonderful book, um, which I so recommend, to come away with, one message, what would that be? Uh, well, I, I, that we are creating our reality with our thoughts and feelings. We're, we're doing it right now. And so, and, and, as within, so it is all around us. And if you want to steer things in a good direction, it's the most important thing is to come back to love, to come back to um, just that feeling of who you really are, to, to take that time to become mindful, to experience the oneness. Uh, that is a big message, too. Just feel that, that oneness, that love, and make time for yourself to really um, develop that practice. And I guess the, the last thing I'd like to add to it is my favorite question, which is how good can it get? I know that's your favorite question. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> that's great. That's your signature. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, no matter what's happening, no matter how good it is or how bad it seems to be, just keep asking, how good can it get? How good can it even get? Even if you feel like, I don't even have the strength to ask that question, I'm giving up, it's, it's worthless. Ask it anyway. <laughs> Throw it out there. It, it's an amazing question, and it just keeps steering things right. That's fantastic. Well, I think that's a poignant message, and we can't be reminded of it enough. And again, I'm going to recommend to everybody listening, go out and get reality shifts. Um, it's a wonderful book. I think it, it's it's a great reminder of um, the, how vast we are as, as human beings and, and, yes, how good can it get and the sky is the limit. Reality shifts when consciousness changes the physical world. Where can people get the book, Cynthia? Well, through my website, realityshifters.com. I can autograph it or you can find it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or ask for it in any bookstore. Excellent, excellent. Well, this has been great. Listen, I also want to mention, speaking of your book, you have been so kind. With Selwa, first of all, thank you to Selwa for her story. I know she's going to find this, this conversation very valuable to her experience. But on top of that, you will be autographing a copy of your book for Selwa. So I, I thank you so much for that. I thank you for that. And, and yes, I believe I believe that you might be giving away another book or two uh, through right. our website. That's great. Well, we're, we're going to have the details of that on both the Higher Journeys 
uh, website, so make sure you come back to higherjourneys.blogspot.com and also visit us on our Facebook page, which is simply facebook.com slash higherjourneys to learn more about how you can enter to win Cynthia's excellent book. This is great. Well, again, Cynthia, thank you so much. And um, tell us the website again, realityshifters.com. Yes, that's right. That's great. Excellent. Selva was afforded a glimpse into another reality that clearly shifted for her right in the midst of her friend's home. Cynthia reminds us that despite these increased abilities afforded to many now on planet Earth, we must use these opportunities responsibly. This is our chance to truly grow as spiritual beings. Perhaps this is what the shift really means. Thanks for listening to Higher Journeys. Until next time, I'm Alexis Brooks.